Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the second installment in our Practical Politics and the Law Speaker Series. Uh, and before beginning, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Schrader and the Program in Public Law uh, for sponsoring the event, as uh, well as the Duke Journal of uh, Constitutional Law and Policy, and also Dana Norvell for helping organize the event and put together food and accommodations for our speaker today. Uh, we're very happy to have Mr. Joe Andrew with us today. Um, and our discussion was originally billed as one on electronic uh, voting and civil rights, but I'm happy to say that uh, it's since been brought into perhaps an even more important discussion about how technology is going to change American politics uh, within our lifetime. Mr. Andrew has enjoyed an extremely diverse and exciting legal career uh, at the intersection, really, of law, politics, and business. Uh, within the legal arena, Mr. Andrew, uh, after graduating from Yale University and Yale Law School, clerked for Chief Judge Joel Flaum of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago. Uh, he's since practiced corporate law for almost 20 years. Uh, he advises Fortune 100 companies on mergers and acquisitions uh, of regulated companies. Uh, he has counseled numerous industries on their government affairs strategies and has also served as a board member on numerous uh, progressive policy organizations and nonprofit groups. Uh, Mr. Andrew is also a very accomplished entrepreneur, uh, having founded a successful medical device company, and he is also uh, an author of a best selling spy novel entitled The Disciples, uh, published by Simon and Schuster. So uh, if you haven't read that, perhaps after today you will want to go get it. <laughs> Uh, but most importantly to our discussion today, uh, Mr. Andrew has also served as a public servant in the political arena. Uh, he helped guide now Senator Evan Bayh to the governorship of Indiana, and he subsequently served as chairman of the Indiana Democratic Party from 1995 to 1999. Then in 1999, he was elected the youngest ever chairman of the Democratic National Committee, and he served in that uh, position through 2001, uh, during which time he led Democra democratic organizational efforts during the uh, infamous 2000 presidential election. Mr. Andrew is currently chairman of the New Democratic Network, which is an organization dedicated to modernizing the Democratic Party, and he is also a partner at Sun and Shine Nathan Rosenthal, where I spent part of my summer last year. Please join me in giving Mr. Andrew a warm Duke welcome. Thanks, Corey. Thanks. Well, thank you, everybody, for spending some uh, time here at lunch today to uh, learn about how a you know nice young guy from Indiana actually ended up being the youngest national chair of the Democratic Party in its 200-year history, and then unfortunately got the role of being involved in uh, one of the closest and certainly one of the most hot contested presidential elections uh, in our history, um, because it's not a pretty story. Um, and I, if I can start by first um, thanking Corey, thanking obviously all the sponsors here, thanking all of you for being here, and thanking Duke Law School uh, for allowing me to come and share a few of my thoughts. As all of you know, even better than I do, this law school has a long tradition of being at the forefront of some of the most interesting civil rights and public policy and political conversations this country has had uh, in the last century and coming into this new century as well. And what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about uh, me, one of my you know, favorite topics, unfortunately, and uh, give you some sense about how I got involved in politics. Uh, and then secondly, try out some new ideas on you and where I think uh, politics in America may be going based principally on where marketing and advertising and new technology is taking all of the process of selling anything, whether or not it's uh, selling an iTunes or selling a United States senator, how that process is changing so dramatically in our country, and how this is going to be, frankly, a very new and I think exciting political world that all of you are going to inherit. The fact is, is that the vast majority of people who are in this law school and rest in politics will probably spend a lot more time involved in the pragmatic political process than they will being a candidate themselves, for example. And yet, I remember that in all of my time growing up, I don't think I ever really talked to somebody who was involved as a lawyer in politics, opposed to as a lawyer who was a candidate. Lots of candidates come marched in and out of this process as well. 
a lot of journalists, a lot of uh, academics, a lot of professors of political science, but I don't remember actually anybody who was involved in politics come and tell me what it was really like and what it was like to be a lawyer involved in that process. Now, that may have been a good thing because having not known, I actually still got involved and I've had a lot of fun doing it. I grew up in a little town in Indiana called Poe, Indiana, spelled just like Edgar Allan Poe, but a hell of a lot scarier. There were 85 people in the little town where I grew up. I grew up on a corn seed farm. And to tell you the uh, importance of branding, even you know, way back then in the uh, late 60s when I was growing up, we had Trojan uh, corn seed, for many of you who are from the Midwest know. And you can imagine how difficult it is to grow up being a teenager and a high school student having big Trojan signs all over your farm when you're growing up. Brands are important and mean something everywhere. I got involved in politics when I was 12 years old working for a congressional candidate who asked me to help go out to the local mall, the first mall that was near Poe, which is near Fort Wayne, Indiana, to hand out bumper stickers uh, for his congressional race, a Democrat who actually amazingly won in 1970. Uh, myself and the other 12-year-olds who were uh, supposed to be hanging out the bumper stickers realized it was a lot easier just to go out in the parking lot and put bumper stickers on the cars rather than handing them out. Even then, we understood the importance of targeted marketing because we figured out that if you had a beat up old jalopy, you ought to be a Democrat, whether or not you were or not. And so we just went out and picked out the worst cars uh, because as 12 year olds, we, we were experts at that and just put bumper stickers on them. Fortunately, I was not arrested or indicted then or since, um, but that was my first you know, real <laughs> endeavor uh, in American politics. Everything from that point on, right? The targeting that I just mentioned, the trying to identify who ought to be part of one party or the other has been what I've been about and has been what contemporary American politics is about. All of that, I think, is about to change. There is a tidal wave coming, and you can either surf on it or you can get drowned by it. It just depends upon whether or not you're paying attention of the changes that are happening in marketing. I went on and got a scholarship uh, uh, to, uh, unlike my, uh, all my siblings who, who went to IU, there was a Yale sophomore named Glenn Peters who died coming off a boat in the Normandy invasion. And his dad left a 1,600-acre dairy farm and trust for someone to go to Yale from one of these old uh, uh, counties that are around the 4th Congressional District. Nobody got into Yale from any one of those counties for 40 years. And so by the time, basically, that I uh, was able to get the scholarship, it was cheaper to go to Yale than it was to go to IU. So I showed up in New Haven, Connecticut, having never seen an escalator. I remember seeing an escalator. We had elevators in Indiana, but not escalators. Uh, uh, why have two stories, you know, when everything is flat and you've got plenty of land? And I remember distinctly uh, that the first escalator I saw was in Macy's in downtown New Haven, Connecticut, which is where I met the mayor uh, of, uh, of New Haven as well, who was hanging out by the escalator just shaking hands with people who were going up and down. As you heard Corey say, I went on and you know, stayed at the law school there. It was a lot easier. I already had an apartment while I moved. Uh, no grades. You, know, you guys may remember that. No grades back those days. Yale Law School is a big motivating factor to go. And uh, then uh, clerked on the Seventh Circuit for Joel Flum uh, because I had an interest in being a, a corporate lawyer and the Seventh Circuit seemed like a decent place to go. And then did what all you know, good law students were supposed to do. I went to Wall Street and went to Sullivan and Cromwell where I spent an absolutely miserable uh, 18 months or so uh, before my friend Evan Bai decided that he was going to run for governor and asked me to come back to Indiana to help him out. And what happened in Indiana, as many of you may know from an historical standpoint, uh, while there was not a single Democratic elected official, statewide elected official, uh, in uh, 1987 uh, when I returned there, uh, there were 11 congressional districts then, eight of which were Republican. Republicans controlled both the state House and the state Senate, and Republicans controlled nine of the ten largest mayor's offices as well. What happened over the next decade was all of those numbers were reversed in Indiana. Democrats, obviously leading, uh, Evan Bayh leading the way, won the governor's race. We controlled the majority of statewide offices, took obviously the Senate seat that Evan Bayh holds now, won back the state House of Representatives. Democrats even today control uh, nine of the ten of the largest mayor's offices in the state as well, and completely reversed what had been almost a half century of Republican rule there as well. 
I had the good luck of being able to come back at a time when all this happened uh, to get involved and begin a legal career as a corporate lawyer uh, at the same time and decided not to spend time inside government after a brief stint after Evan Bayh was elected, but rather to spend time inside politics because, one, I enjoyed the actual practice of law. I enjoyed the renumination that was part of it. I enjoyed meeting the people that made the political process possible in a state like Indiana. The business people that were there, the entrepreneurs, the executives, the doctors and lawyers and farmers and Indian chiefs who were all about making sure that Democrats could get elected in that process and became therefore a campaign operative, a campaign manager, eventually the youngest state Democratic chairman in the country in order to try to make all of that possible. And when I came into American politics, was a time period when technology itself became an important tool in making sure that we could identify our voters, get our voters out, and change, again, this long history of one-party rule in the state of Indiana. How did that happen? Where did it all start? Let me kind of back up here, if I can, and, and brick by brick describe to you a little bit about what has happened in American politics over the past century, in my view, that built the two large political parties, where and how we got to where we are today before I describe where I think we're going to go. And then I hope we can have a conversation with your questions once I lay out this science fiction fantasy of the politics of the future about what that means to each one of you for your legal career, whether you work inside a firm, whether you work inside a public policy organization, whether you choose to be a candidate yourself, what is this new world order that is happening around us that I believe will make a difference uh, for each one of you as well? At the dawn of the last century, with the influx of immigrants from all around the world, American politics dramatically changed. And I'm going to try to jump into a little bit of a idea, few ideas that I've written down here as well. Uh, and I'll explain to you why I've actually written them down. So I apologize for reading a little bit here as we go through this. But the reason is, is because I think if you lay out the brick by brick where we are, build the path to where we're going to go, that this will be an important conversation, not just here for today, but for a lot of the political activities that I'm involved in on a national basis uh, throughout the country. All of these new citizens, obviously, that came into the country, obviously formed a new kind of government. Tammany Hall came out of this as well. But they also built a new kind of politics, a politics that I've called in the past a transitive property of trust. For the first time, politics left retail markets and went to wholesale markets. Thousands, sometimes millions of people in a city like New York City or large urban areas who no longer literally knew the candidate, couldn't meet the candidate, couldn't shake the candidate's hand, often didn't speak the same language of the candidate, certainly weren't the same religion as the candidate. Their kids didn't go to the same schools the candidate's kids do. They had no social interaction for the first time really in American politics. What happened then was the ward boss, the precinct chair, a change in politics that built up party superstructures where someone would come to you and say, look, you and I speak the same language. We're from the same mother country. We share the same religion. Our kids go to school together. We live in the same neighborhood together. We're part of the same ethnic group together. You trust me because of those things that we have in common. I know the candidate. Trust me to steer you to the right candidate, right? a transitive property of trust of which built the two great political parties throughout this country. It happened different in the South. It happened different in many of the suburbs where Republicans did well. But that was the fundamental building block of the political parties was that transitive property and trust. The arrival of television obviously changed all of that. Not only did, of course, America become more homogenized with television, we all listened to three basic network channels, right? Everybody started taking on the same diction, that flat Midwestern accent that whoever was reading the news has had since the uh, dawn of network television. But more importantly, the candidates could go directly to the people now. They could speak through a 30-second ad, through the news program, through the news interview, directly to a candidate. And if you go to any of the great presidential libraries across the country, I was just at the Kennedy Library this past weekend where I was giving a speech as well, and you can watch the change suddenly when John F. Kennedy could sit down and have a 20-minute interview in the early 1950s on TV, or Edward Murrow could visit the Kennedy home right after he got married and Jackie could show them around their home and talk about them as people and could talk about their families and talk about their vacations, and then they would show on television going out to the 
24-foot little skiff and going sailing together as well. All of that allowed John Kennedy and politicians like him to talk directly to voters and not have to go through a party apparatus. The parties obviously adapted to that by making sure that they found candidates eventually that were, one, good on TV, that they raised the money to put people on TV, an entire superstructure obviously built up throughout the 60s here that was all, and obviously long into the 80s, that was all about television and all, unfortunately, about the money it took to get people on TV. That's when I showed up in American politics, basically, is at the tail end here, into the 80s, of the television air as well. My contribution was trying to find ways to both to, once we recognized that television was very good at persuading people about how to vote, but not so good at actually getting them to the polls and getting them out to vote, to use new computer technology to build the logistics of politics, the supply line, to use a military analogy, how we were going to try to use new demographic studies to identify exactly who our voters were, what it took to get them to the polls, and the mechanics of physically getting them there. That's when the arrival of the computer made a big difference. The computer allowed us to slice and dice, obviously, the demographic data to learn more about who would support a particular candidate, a particular cause, who was on the fence, who was the undecided voter, and then find ways, usually through more direct marketing than television, uh, which had a tremendous spillover, to actually phone people, mail people with specific messages that we believe that household would react to. The danger of television is always the spillover. Even the 2000 election, which was the last presidential election fought over on these old rules, every television ad could not be targeted to specific demographic group or even specifically to a Democrat or Republican. There was always at least a third to a half spillover. You're actually addressing a television ad to somebody who is not who you want that television ad to be addressed to. And so the ad itself must always be uh, measured, must always be pulled back, must always be thought through to make sure that you were not going to offend a potential voter, but not the voter you had actually targeted in that process. Now, in Indiana, we found a way to do that. And the principal thing we were good at, unfortunately, was this simple fact, raising money. Because in a television age, politics became about the dollars it cost in order to put those television ads on. I raised more money per capita than a state chair, Democrat or Republican, in the United States of America for four years straight in the middle 90s. Again, by using targeted marketing, taking the same computer data and demographic data that sliced and spiced, decided where we should go, what voters were ours, to figure out who in turn would give us money, who we can make a phone call to, write a letter to, who could pick up a phone. And the dark side of politics, which is all about the funding, was all driven by the simple fact that you had to pay for television to get it on. And in a state like Indiana, Democrats won not just because of the fact we had a good message, not just because we were right on the issues, not just because, as I believe, our party is more inclusive than our opposition, that regardless of your race or religion or gender or sexual preference, you're going to be more welcome inside the Democratic Party, and that that is the core of our strength. None of that is what actually allowed us to win. Because it was not right, not good enough to simply be right on the issues, right opposed to wrong on the issues. You had to be right opposed to wrong on the politics. And the political process depended, unfortunately, on the dollars to put that, uh, those messages, that message of inclusivity, the messages that we knew would win on the television. David Broder wrote an article about me after I became the youngest state Democratic chair who also owned a technology company. You heard Corey mention I started a company in the early 90s that commercializes uh, technology for like, ultrasound and MRI. It's in the bioscience area, figuring out how to be able to, so that a physician sitting on a beach in the Bahamas can get your MRI or your ultrasound beamed down to them back in the days when this was actually an amazing thing rather than something that we all just assume can happen now, and be able to assist in the diagnosis of whatever your problem might be, regardless if they're on vacation, regardless of the fact that it's being sent from a battlefield uh, someplace as well, or in the middle of a desert out in Africa where there are so few physicians to be able to actually diagnose people's problems. That technology basis 
frankly, was more of a gimmick for me as a politician than anything else. Obviously, the bioscience technology had absolutely nothing to do with this demographic technology, but it gave me the credibility to go and talk to people, the credibility to have programs written specifically for my needs as a state chair, and a national platform to be able to go out and try to convince people that the technology mattered and that you should invest in the technology in the party. Clearly, that was one of the reasons why we were able to raise a lot of money. Wired Magazine did a little fluff piece on me as well. David Broder wrote a story about bringing new technology into the little old, you know, the, the cornfields of Indiana, as he described. And that's why I was, you know, plucked from those cornfields of Indiana to be the national chair of the party early in 1999, when I was the grandiose age of 38, which I know seems very old, but at the time was actually, you know, historically young to be able to, to lead the party. What we were able to do at the Democratic National Committee was tempered by the one simple fact that the party was $40 million in debt. And in a television age where money is your, is your lifeline, your ability to be able to put a message in place, the fact that in January of 1999, the Democratic Party was literally virtually bankrupt, could not pay the salaries of the limited number of staff that it had, a staff that was down to 88 people on the Democratic side, opposed to 388 people inside the Republican National Committee, $40 million in debt in the DNC, opposed to $37 million in the plus with the RNC, was in and of itself virtually determinative of the outcome of the 2000 election unless it could be changed. While we all discussed and debated about whether or not Monica Lewinsky, uh, the effect of Monica would be able to change the dynamic of that election in 2000, unless the finances of the two parties could be put straight, you could almost predict in a television era when unfortunately still 90% of the communications that people would receive from even a presidential candidate would come from paid media. It's virtually 98 to 99% in a Senate race or a gubernatorial race, obviously virtual, uh, virtually 100% obviously in races that are below that, would, was determined on our ability to be able to raise funds. And so the lawyers who were involved in that process had one important role, which is to be able to reach deep and find new ways in order to be able to gather the dollars just to make sure that Al Gore could be competitive in that process at all. What the targeting that was involved in that race was the same, frankly, even though uh, much less it had been 20 years before, right? Yes, we bought cable television. Yes, we would try to do more targeted television. But the reality of it was there was spillover. There was lots of messages to people that you had no idea who they are or what they are about. And it was the last election, as I said, that was fought on, over on those old rules. What happened with the advent, not so much of internet existence, but of internet use after the 2000 election is two important things. One, certain voters certain voters went upscale in terms of their economics. The digital divide, which is an important and a very important issue throughout this country, became dramatically less important when we came to politics because of the unfortunate effect that the people who are most likely to show up at the polls are people who can afford a computer, people who are online. And that digital divide from voters opposed to the digital divide into America went dramatically down after the 2000 election. And while we still, in 2004, fought out a television war, the internet became obviously an important organizational tool, an important communication tool, and obviously became important in the entire process of organizing and choosing who our candidate would be in 2004. Additionally, McCain-Feingold changed the whole dynamic of raising money. Being able to bring in smaller dollar donations was the only way you could finance these campaigns. The internet became the best and most effective way to reach out to people and be able to bring the money in as well. And thirdly, new voters came to the fore, particularly Hispanic voters, who while in the, are a large, diverse community, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Mexican American, whatever the heritage may be, that they were able, we were able to individually target with less spillover to Hispanic candidates than any other swing voters in the history of American politics because of Univision, Telemundo, and the ability to have language-specific advertising. All of that changed 2004, at least on the surface, though we all recognize that ultimately, while Move On, for example, would have television ads you could download from their site, we are still talking about two separate worlds, a television world and an internet world. And the two did not cross in American politics. Now, I knew and predicted at the time that they would, right? And here it comes, the new world order. 
Let me explain to you something that happened to me just last week, and I think it'll give you a sense of where we're going to go. I had a fundraiser at my house, not coincidentally. It was for Evan Bayh. Had a new house, decided that the first fundraiser new house better be for Evan Bayh, otherwise I'd be in trouble. As I introduced him that night, a guest took a photograph of the two of us on their cell phone, a little digital photograph emailed that digital photograph to a friend while I was standing there introducing Evan Bai. That friend posted that photo of me standing next to Evan Bai on their blog right then as well. A political website that kind of tracks presidential candidates, obviously using Google video search, assisted, suggestive, coach searched, purely programmed in, picked up that photo instantaneously and on their site, matched that photograph with three others that they had just searched. Me standing next to Evan Bayh, me standing next to Bill Clinton, me standing next to Al Gore, me standing next to John Kerry. Put those three, four photographs up on their site with a story where, who is Joe Andrew, former national chair, supporting for president of the United States as well. Another site took that one, right, a Republican-oriented site, immediately picked up and did a search on what clients, as a corporate lawyer, I represent. Found out, mentioned new house, found out the price of the brand new house, which they listed. You know, we as Republicans like to attack Democrats if you make money. That's a definition in this process as well. Put a link to the architect who had designed the house, as well as a link to my law firm site as well, and the clients that the law firm has. Put all of that on their blog. Another friend of mine who has their website set up for Evan by mentions automatically picked that one up, emailed me that onto my Blackberry right here, which I read while the caterers were still packing up at my home that evening. The next morning, I got a whole series of emails from all kinds of services you'd use if you had a new house. Landscapers, <laughs> right, plumbers, including a whole series of contemporary furniture emails, which I can only subscribe to the fact that there was one line that described my house as modern, and so I got four emails just about contemporary furniture. Thus, the world changed, right? And thus, American politics changed. It's gonna look like this. Let me describe what I think it's gonna look like, right? And then I'm gonna back up brick by brick and try to explain why I think we're going to get there and how this is literally going to change the life of everybody in this room. Just as a lawyer, if you never touch politics, your life is going to be changed, I think, by the way in which political marketing is going to change the way in which legislation is made, the laws that each one of us are going to work with, how lobbying is going to change, how the M&A world that I deal in is going to change. Corporate lawyers will not be immune to this. And clearly, the regulatory world, for any of you who choose to be an antitrust lawyer, an environmental lawyer, an oil lawyer, whatever it may be, I think is going to change dramatically. For-profit venture and hedge funds will target individual progressive causes that will invest in for-profit progressive media companies probably run by you know, all of our friends, liberal media professionals, that will own individual media platforms or channels that will specifically and narrowly target different democratic groups with interactive message lines, as they call them, message lines, that will be progressive only because they will appeal to the viewers, the listeners, the participants, who will be plugged in through their BlackBerry, iPod, GPS, PayPal, wireless, Quicken-oriented, interactive video actor that will have thousands of digital channels in which you can verbally search or Google video-wise, if you'd like, with suggest suggestive interactive assistance to find whatever entertainment or news or shopping or music, whatever it is you want, and that will create this digital lifestyle that it will inevitably guide you in your offline lifestyle by steering you to the music, restaurants, books, places, and shops, and people that make up what you do every day. OK, so what does all that gobbledygook mean, right? What is that really about? What it's about is, is that we are going to create in politics, on my side of the aisle, a progressive lifestyle, where the party itself is no longer dominant but the lifestyle that is created around all the goods and services that you interact with every single day can be directly targeted to you if you're progressive, 
or directly targeted to someone else if they're conservative. When Steve Jobs inter uh, introduced a little video iPod this week, I know all the technology critics were very quick to point out all of its limitations as well. But as a politician, what I saw was this first ripple of the way the world changes. While we're not really there yet, the idea of full motion digital video with thousands, right, thousands of interactive channels, each targeting a narrowly sliced demographic group and all constantly available on a miniature device with personalized software and hardware and fieldware that incorporates all that we now think of, right, as your Blackberry, as your iPod, as your Amazon shopper, as your Quicken, as your PayPal. Obviously, we now have just introduced legislation to have digital licenses, as your driver's license, right? And even most important, as your platinum American Express card that comes with you at graduation, by the way, with a diploma. All of those things, obviously, all geared into one device, right? That with its Bluetooth activation allows you not just to view it on the small screen, but as I saw when I was uh, with uh, Jobs last week, as you walk by any screen, you can simply verbally tell it to broadcast whatever you want there. The world will be full of 60-inch plasmas that you simply direct whatever you want to watch there. Everything I just described exists today, right? Steve Jobs carries it around with him. But what it does is has an ability, particularly through the suggestive search engines, to be able to create a lifestyle around you a lifestyle in the sense that it can track not only what you buy with the GPS where you go, but will constantly suggest things that you can also buy, view, listen, be part of, that the algorithms that Amazon and that Google currently have right now will match the kinds of things they think that you'll be interested in. Once you've self-identified as a progressive, you'll see a progressive world. Once you self-identify as blue being your favorite color, you'll see a blue world. It really is that simple. Voters who were empowered by the new technology, the internet, where the voter itself, the voter became more important, the voter had access to deeper and more richer information, you could find out things about it. As I speak now, right now, each one of you can go on the website and learn anything about me that you want to with the laptops in front of you. You are empowered. But what this new technology does is it now empowers the politicians as well. It empowers the politicians to know more about you and to be able to target more narrowly to you as well. Now, I don't want to spend too much time going into this entire evolution, but what I'm predicting here is the not-for-profit committees, the Democratic National Committee, all the 527s that came up in the last campaign, move on, or things like a Democratic or Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, all those not-for-profits that currently try to do politics uh, will literally become adjuncts to for-profit companies as well, because the light line between commercial speech and political speech, already hazy, right, could virtually disappear in this world where, where your perspective is, your political perspective, your attitude about things is an exceptionally important part about who you are to market to. Therefore, for-profit companies have got more incentive than ever before to understand that, to figure out exactly what your politics are on a whole group of issues, and more narrowly tailor their messages specifically to you to match that. Not your politics as if you're a Democrat or Republican, right? But in all the different variations on different issues. You may be a pro-environment, pro-gun control, anti-choice person on weekends, but during the week you've got a completely different idea, right? Your personal profile will follow you right through that based on what you choose to see, to listen, where you eat, where you go, all the different kinds of things that that's suggestive, coachable search ability that so many of you deal with every single day. Every time you click on Amazon to buy something, they say, wouldn't you also like to have X, Y, and Z? When you go to Netflix and they say, you know what, if you like that movie, you're gonna like this one, right? That happens with restaurants right now, for those of you who use any kind of the restaurants guidance. If you like this restaurant, you're gonna like that one, right? All of that becomes more and more important in the marketing of all kinds of politics, all kinds of things, and clearly, politics is not far behind. Democratic candidates who've already found themselves, you know, actors on a movie stage will now have to navigate through a new world of companies designing, selling, furnishing, and furthering this progressive lifestyle. 
Now, I think Republican candidates may be able to remain a little more relevant by themselves longer because conservatives tend to be slower adapters of new technology. But eventually, obviously, the conservative lifestyle will happen just like I'm describing it for the progressive lifestyle. And for any of you who've listened to Rush Limbaugh uh, on, uh, on radio a lot, you'll know that sometimes it's, it's a very thin dividing line between where Rush and the conservative commentary ends and where the advertisements that go with it stop because talk radio is the closest type of specific targeted marketing that I'm talking about that we have right now in the existing political realm as well. Thousands of digital channels to choose from, an ability to create your own channel by having your own playlist of what you view or participate in, what you like, what you don't like as well, you know, it, a way, ability to follow you through each one of the websites you deal with, all of that is going to make sure that we can find ways to be able to target and market specifically to you as an individual. Not you as a demographic category, but you as an individual. So here's what happens, right? Uh, you may see a whole new world about how environmentally friendly Ford Motor Company is just to you, where somebody else is only going to get exactly how powerful the new 150 pickup truck is, right? Target has better labor standards than Walmart, they'll say. Coke is drunk by somebody who looks like you. Let's say you're early 20s, Asian American woman wearing dark European clothing, right? They know that in your search. You know, that's somebody who kind of looks like you drinking that Coke. You know, wait a minute. With video, that actually is a picture of you drinking that Coke. Not just someone like you, that is you, because your cookie that went with you has got that photograph with you. You're not just dialing in to ask a question of Hillary Clinton on Hillary Clinton's website. That's you sitting there talking to Hillary Clinton. Because already today, on the new Clinton website that's coming out next week, there will be recorded 150 different messages, right? 150 questions asked of Hillary Clinton. She answers each one of them. Each one of those messages could be specifically and will be targeted to you. You're a early 20s Asian American woman wearing dark Italian clothing. You tell that to Hillary Clinton, you say, answer this question as if you're talking to that person. And what will happen in the future is thousands of individual recordings so that you can speak directly to Hillary Clinton, or at least your computer is speaking directly to Hillary Clinton's computer. It's not, frankly, what's on the screen that obviously makes the biggest changes. It's that suggestive, assertive search function that obviously builds these profiles of each one of us that will make so much of a difference in politics as well. Uh, you know, you, you, in the past, the biggest difference here has been is that people involved in marketing have tried to stray away from politics, right? You separate politics as much as you can from any kind of shopping that you do because of the spillover effect. You don't want to appeal, you don't want to say the new Ford SUV hybrid is great for Democrats because Republicans' money is just as green and just as good. But if Ford Motor Company knew they were sending a specific message to someone who was clearly a progressive, there is no question, because every study shows the more specific your message is, you're more likely you're able to sell a product to that person, that they can and they will do just that. Obviously, politics will follow in that process as well. Obviously, all of this stuff is new and coming, right? But so much of the individual technology we're talking about is here today. Each one of these different types of things I've discussed is happening around us right now. It's the combination of them that clearly will change marketing over the next couple of years and clearly will change the politics of marketing in this process. Will politicians themselves become even more celebrities than they are? Clearly, most politicians are celebrities within the basic geographic area they represent, unless they're a national candidate like Hillary, you know, one name, Hillary, Madonna, in which case they become na not only national but international figures as well. You know, every politician becomes a celebrity in the sense that to be able to break through in that marketing, the better known you are, the more likely that you are identified with a particular demographic group, the more likely that for-profit media companies are going to want to use you in order to appeal to those groups, right? I mean, it's this simple as well. If you're not going to get Barack Obama, right, to endorse Ford and its SUV, but you could get Barack Obama to send a specific message praising the policies and programs of the following dozen companies that are doing the right thing on whatever piece of legislation or issues that Barack Obama cares about. And so Barack Obama becomes a tool, a part of a larger marketing effort, right? He is a tool and part of that process based on his own choosing because he wants to get his message through. He's trying to change the world on some issue. 
In order to do that, he needs to communicate with as many people. The companies that are busy trying to do the same thing, whatever it may be, have the interest to make sure you can push and you can market that exact same issue that he's trying to push as well. The world changes, politics changes because of all those things. Ultimately, what this is all based on is, is that you can't create a digital lifestyle to sell anything, whether it's Ford or Coke, unless that lifestyle has a political perspective. Because politics, or at least a perspective on political issues, is something that we're all about as well. You know, what happened in Iraq today, what happened in your neighborhood today, at your school today, all of that stuff influences how it is you look at things and thus how people want to try to address you. Do you want to know about President Bush visiting the Gulf Coast again, or do you want to make fun of him because he's out there once again trying to you know, beat the rap that he's got and be able to push up those flagging poll numbers? Are you a Fox TV viewer or are you a Jon Stewart fan? It's more than a political label, as you can see. It's not Democrat or Republican. It's about are you a cynic or not a cynic? How do you approach each one of these individual issues as well? Are you attracted to humor or tragedy? I won't say which one is the Democrat or Republican side on that. But, you know, you, but all of those things come up about who you are, what you're about. You don't have to answer the question, are you attracted to humor or tragedy, right? The search engine answers it for you based on the choices that you make, the places you go, who you are, and what you're about. Clearly, I'll spend a lot of my time over the next 10 years giving speeches here about the importance of privacy, the difficulty of the digital divide, right? All the problems in this world that I just talked about. But ultimately, it will happen because of ease of use, right? If you can combine ease of use, convenience, with entertainment, it always works and it always wins. It has since the beginning of American politics when uh, we, you would have you know, uh, uh, dramas and shows before each one of the political debates just to make sure that people will get there as well. Obviously, I think there's gonna have a lot of dramatic changes on just small bits of contemporary politics because of this as well. While all of us are gonna be able to get more information on a candidate so much quicker, right? You're gonna be able to sit there and as soon as somebody says something, be able to pick up information about them. It also is gonna be easier to simply video candidates, right? Digital video is free uh, these days as well. So why not spend 24 hours with every presidential candidate as they're out on the hustings, right? Every presidential primary becomes like the movie The Truman Show. You never leave them. And because of that, we'll see the human side of politicians more. You're going to see them angry. You're going to see warts and all. You're going to see them make mistakes in the process because that more of their life will be more accessible to you without an editor standing between you and whatever it is they would like it, uh, to be seen about them as well. Because that digital video is so easy, and more importantly, because the digital editing is so easy, there will also be a rush here to try to figure out what's real, what's authentic because it's so easy to put anybody's head on somebody else's body, to have somebody's mouth say things they never dreamed of saving. So therefore, the entire, there'll become an entire industry of people who will try to authenticate whether something actually happened or did not happen in politics. All of these things, I think, that will, will come uh, through this process as well. Ultimately, you've got to remember here that while the internet and what we're talking is used first and most importantly for pornography, second, and almost as important for gambling, politics is actually a close and growing third. More people use the internet for politics than they do for shopping in America right now. So to talk about how that digital lifestyle is created and the importance of politics into it is not a fantasy land here when there are more people using the internet for more outreach, more touching, more gathering information for politics than they are for anything other than pornography and gambling. How a digital lifestyle will change those two things, I'll leave for another day and, and someone who has a little more expertise than I do in that. But thus, I think politics is changed. What is going to be needed in that change are people like you who are not just people who will participate in it, but who will be leaders, who will take that new dynamic, that new world here, uh, that's not just about bumper stickers, but is literally about a digital lifestyle and the progressive and the conservative lifestyle that come from that, and find ways to use it to make sure that the issues we care about, the things that affect real people every day, are actually part of that lifestyle, are promoted and pushed by that lifestyle, so that the ongoing fights that we have had, the ongoing struggles to make sure this country is a better place, are ones that are not lost in the technology, are not lost in the commercialization of politics, but rather become part and parcel of it as well. 
That's the role of lawyers here. Smart lawyers, smart people who can make sure that we can create a system around that new technology so that it can be used for the better and not for the worse. I know that you're going to be part of that as well. I look forward uh, to talking to you about it from my retirement home, uh, someplace that you'll easily be able to find as soon as it's emailed to you. So thank you very much, and I look forward to answering your questions. Yes, is this, is this microphone on here, or is this just for recording purposes? It's on. It's on? OK, great. Yes. I have a question. You seem to be really concerned from a marketing perspective about the problem of spillover. But it feels to me that like that's something that helps keep candidates honest. Because if, if my views are somehow like somewhat aligned with the candidate, but also different, like I'm pro-gun control, but also pro-life, then my computer is going to know that. And every time I go to the candidate's website, it's going to pop up how the candidate's pro-gun control. But it'll be really hard for me, even if I look for it, to find his position on abortion because my, the computer will hide it from me because they know I don't wanna, I'm not going to agree. And that I'm only going to get the email that, that agrees with me. So how do you keep it like truth in advertising and from having the candidate have every position so that everybody's happy? I mean, sure. how do you keep it? Well, it is, it, as you know, obviously, that's been you know, the hallmark of American politics, right, from George Washington on, is George Washington's interest and ability of trying to make everybody happy, right, of having as many positions or as diffuse positions as possible. Obviously, all of us as voters are much more empowered now because we have the access to more information about them. And so the constant battle is still going to be the same that it's always been since George Washington. It's just now going to happen instantaneously where the politicians are going to try to make sure that they, they can tailor a message to you just like they would if they were standing here talking to you. And that they're talking to you, but they know a lot about you now, right? You're not just somebody who just shook their hand and met. They now know everything that's going to be part of your profile, and they'll try to uh, adapt what they would say as they would to someone like you who they knew very well. And so the spillover is still obviously going to be there, but it's no longer spillover, right? It's no longer unintentional. Now it's got to be an intentional dynamic answer knowing that other people are going to be searching through it. So the difference really is not is only what's in, if it's intentional or not intentional, right? The difference is not whether it exists or not. And so that concept of spillover has only been important because it's unintentional, where you can't, you can't target to somebody and specifically answer the questions that you think they have. It's not about altering your message. It's just that in a million issues that every human being has to deal with, alone a politician, what is it that I talk to you about? And having a dynamic profile that actually tells me what you're interested about allows me, therefore, to allows my computer, therefore, to direct a specific answer to you about the things I know you care about. So I'll know that you care not just about a woman's right to choose. You also care about gun control, and you want to hear about both of them. And that you and that I can either give I can give you uh, you know a a lot of memory on that and you can choose how much you actually want to read or listen to or simply view. I mean, this whole idea of reading, of course, is what's also going to change dramatically because we're so used to editing our emails. And, and, but now, obviously, in a totally verbal and visual world again, it's going to be, uh, the, you know, even that editing function is obviously not going to be happening there in that process. Yes? I agree that Democrats can't stay in the last age. And if this is the direction <coughs> the technology is going, then we need to move, it, move in that direction. But in your discussion, there's one missing point, um, and that's that regardless of how well we can target a message, we have to have the right candidate. And that candidate has to have views and has to have a way of expressing those views that the American people will, will, will glom on to. Um, I worry that this technology is going to lead to more I voted for it before I voted against it moments, except that one monitor is going to get the vote for and the other monitor is going to get the vote against, and that having this technology is going to facilitate moments like that. Um, the other thing that I worry about is it's going to eliminate political courage um, in the sense that you know, you're know you an Evan Bayh supporter. If Evan Bayh wants my vote, I want him to personally apologize to me for voting for the Iraq war. And but, is he going to do something like that no, in no, a no. public setting? But, but make, let me just see, see, you just gave the example of why actually I believe the opposite's going to happen. 
you're going to see more courage, not less, right? Because right now and today, Evan Bayh or any of the Democrats for the war, they can avoid that question, right? But in this new world, when they talk to you, right, and you go on to their computer, they can't avoid it. It's part of, you're asking directly, it's part of your profile. If they avoid it, you're going to keep asking, right? And you're going to try to make sure you get in front of them to make sure you can ask them. What this, this word that I'm talking about, I don't think, again, this doesn't necessarily right, change the type of people that become candidates, but it clearly empowers people much more. And so I think what you're going to find, I hope what we're going to find, is people who have to, in order to get your support, answer more specific questions than they did before. And it's the specificity that's different here, right? It's not that what you're asking here about whether it's the Iraq war or any other issue is you want to know exactly how somebody is going to explain the actions they took, right or wrong. And we're going to have to, therefore, I believe, have to have people who are much more articulate, who are much better educated about the set of issues because they're going to get much more specific, much better educated questions. And you're not going to be able to avoid things as easily. I mean, obviously, in a pre-television era, you know, even people who look like me could get elected to office, right? It didn't matter who you were, what you looked like, what you said. It was all about uh, your internal personal relationships and building, you know, some campaign as well, where you could actually get an elective office as well. Abraham Lincoln, you know, one of the worst orators, right, in American history, sounded horrible, right? When you read it, it's great. That won't, that will change. You won't, that will be unlikely to happen, obviously, in this new world order. You have to have people who are smart as Abraham Lincoln, but they've also got to be able to, you know, to sound and probably look good in the process. That is one of the negatives that will happen. Quick follow-up? Sure. Evan by for his apology, and he gives a an answer that would be embarrassing if it showed up on CNN. Sure, it's not going to show up on CNN now. And frequently, the way that we find out that a candidate is not someone that we want to vote for is because that embarrassing clip rightfully appears on CNN. How is this technology going to? I mean, this technology yeah. will prevent that clip from being disseminated when we want it disseminated to the public? Yeah, I think that the two, two answers. The qu your question is really is, will CNN exist right, in this new world? Right? Will, will large news-based broadcasts still exist? I think that's an open question. Obviously, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, it seems to me that what we find right now is obviously that, all, that, they be, that the cable network news is now becoming as crippled as the larger th network news was because of the fact that people are more and more getting information from individual sources that they go to anyway. You know, for example, it, it was amazing uh, in this last 2004 campaign about how people would get news filtered to whatever group they belong to. So you'd see, for example, like people that belong to a gardening website, right? would get their views of the presidential campaign, get their views of the Iraq war filtered through the news section on their gardening website, right? Or all the Harley lovers on their Harley website, right? So though it was, you, set, you get a, an individual, more narrowly defined perspective more and more about how people even get the news. They're getting it from a perspective of people that are like them in a way that we did not have before. And so my biggest fear, uh, the fear that I have about this is not about whether our candidates are brave or not brave, I'm going to always assume they aren't, is whether or not we lose the sense of forum. We lose the sense of community where we speak about issues collectively that goes across boundary, demographic boundaries, where people, regardless of race or religion or background, all come together to have our arguments and have our conversation. There was a time period when I believe the internet would actually further that, that we'd have more conversation than we, and rather than less. My fear as things get more narrowly targeted in suggestive, assertive search lets, it gets you ability to program direct marketing, that we lose the forum, that we lose the commonality uh, that comes from that process that builds, frankly, nation states, right? There are a lot of obviously philosophers who believe nation state is built by commonality, is built by the forum in some form or fashion. I, I'll go up here. Yeah. I want to push that just a little further, actually. I worry in this, this coming age that we're going to lose not just a common forum, but a common set of facts, right? It seems like you're talking about the candidate's got to be more well informed, and I'm worried what the candidate's got to do is become a better uh, propagandist, right? Because I know people who listen to Fox News and Rush Limbaugh, and they think Saddam Hussein was involved in 9 11 and had weapons of mass destruction. Right. And I live in a world where that's just not true. And we, we inhabit yes. totally separate realities for all intents and purposes. And yeah, I worry right. the candidate's going to just have to come forward and say, look, here's, I'm going to push my view of reality on you and not 
let's not worry about whether it has any bearing with actual reality. Right. Well, look, I mean, that, that's, that you've hit, I think, right, uh, right on one of the key fundamental issues about the loss of form and commonality. Seventy percent of people who say that their principal source of news is Fox News believe there is a direct relationship between Al Qaeda and the war in Iraq, right? Seventy percent of people who claim that NPR is their principal basis of news believe the exact opposite, right? So what you've got is based on source of information, right, completely divergent views of one of the most fundamental political and governmental issues of our time. Now, I have an opinion, I think I, you sound like you share it, about what is reality and what is not reality here, right? But as lawyers, this is, this is the ground that we play in, right? This is our world which is trying to talk about how you know, life is not black and white, it is gray, but trying to make sure that we can identify what are actual facts that you can and should make decisions on. Our world is about trying to identify credibility, trying to authenticate what is real and what is not real, what is, and even more importantly, what is actually real and relevant to the actual decision that needs to be made. Unfortunately, politics has gone right now the exact opposite, right? It's not just about what is not real or not real, but it's taking some things that are real but are totally irrelevant to the decision and being able to get people to move on that decision based on them. That is obviously, in my view, what this administration is so successful at. Not so much on what's real or not real, but taking irrelevant real things and making those the movers on a set of decisions as well. That world could be much worse than it is today based on the kinds of individual and narrowly targeted marketing that's coming our direction. And again, we either fight it or we try to learn, particularly as lawyers, how to adapt to it and how to try to make sure that we can put together institutions and organizations in order to make sure that we can, you know, we can try to make sure there is a basic set of facts that we can at least have arguments over. Yeah? Do you think that uh, parties are going to have to, what sort of technologies parties will be investing in to take events kind of thing, right? In the past decade has been databases. You're absolutely, I mean, databases um, will obviously still be more important, but again, databases have all been about trying to figure out who you are as a voter, right? The reality of it is, in, in a profiled world, you tell the person you're contacting who you are, right? There's a whole set of information that comes to the person that you are contacting or the organization you're contacting about what your choices are, your patterns are, your opinions of. So the party's interest and ability and all the money we spent in trying to learn as much about you becomes a little bit less important than it has before. It now is more about a developing databases to answer your questions. You know, it's not an easy thing to say that people have, you know, take a, a low number of questions people want to ask the Democratic National Committee. 10,000, right? And exactly who do you put in video to be able to answer those 10,000 questions, right? You're not talking about 10,000 pieces of you know, digital video to be able to answer somebody's question because it's not going to be good enough to read it anymore. You've got to see it. You've got to hear it. And of each one of those questions, if you're the Democratic Party, let's say you want to answer a very narrowly defined question on the environment, on wetlands in the Midwest, right? I still am going to want to have somebody, if you're African American, I want somebody who's African American answering your question. If you're Asian American, I want somebody who's Asian American answering your question. If you're a woman, if you're male, wherever you may be, you may want somebody who makes sure they sound like they're from the Midwest, right? Or if it's a question about rebuilding Katrina in New Orleans, let's have somebody who actually sounds like they're from New Orleans, who looks like they're from New Orleans, answering that question to build credibility. It all becomes, you know, this horribly contorted marketing world of trying to make sure that we build a sense of trust through that video with your person in order to try to convince them of something. Because ultimately that's what politics is about, you know, it's convincing somebody of something. Well, I think, it, I think that the short answer is they have to invest in answering people's questions in such a way to make them as trustworthy as possible or to convince someone of something. Today, they supply information, right? What, what happened in my tenure is that we went from being databases just about how do we slice and dice demographics in order to reach out to voters to becoming through the DNC website and through our pushing information on people an information source. 
And today, obviously, people get information on all kinds of things by going to you know, the websites of these different political committees as well. You get your daily talking points right, from each one of those things as well. What I'm now talking about is, is that we're going to move from supplying the information to be able to push that information on you with not just a message we think that you'll like, whoever you is, but a messenger that you will trust in that process. So based on what we know about you, we figure out whether or not it's Barack Obama or Nancy Pelosi who ought to be answering the question. OK. So I hate to tell you this, the, the quote on the Republican blogs for me today is, has got to be that Barack Obama is a tool. Um, <laughs> just, just warning you in case you see it on your email. Um, but it, it brings up the discussion you're having. At That's the a perfect party. example of what's real and what's not real. Right? Exactly. <laughs> the, the, uh, point you were addressing at that point in your talk, I thought it was a very interesting one. And it, it makes me wonder what it is in this system that's going to prevent us from slipping insensibly from kind of packaged candidates into corporate manufactured candidates. Because the incentives that you mentioned for um, for-profit progressive companies to become involved in this market sure. exist to drive the existing political industrial complex to essentially creating candidates that are that are sufficiently targeted to meet our, our consumption needs for politics. Right. So I'm wondering, what is it that, that will continue to um, allow candidates to be independent of those for-profit funding sources? Well, uh, the short answer is nothing. And let me give you some examples about how that's true today. Okay. Right. That that's not the way it is. Every <laughs> state legislature in America today is an example of what you're talking about. Teachers, teachers unions, go out and find teachers to run for office to make sure there's a teacher who's a state representative. Insurance companies go out and find insurance agents to run to make sure there's a voice of insurance inside there. Uh, the laborers and the sheet metal workers and each and every organization, right? I'm, and I'm using examples on the Democratic side as well. I'm not trying to say this is a Republican problem. It is an institutional problem that state legislatures basically, each individual person more and more does not represent a, a geographic district as much often as a viewpoint as well. Trial lawyers are trying to recruit trial lawyers, right? And just go down the list as well. It, uh, every different, you know, different types of communities are trying to influence it. Chambers of commerce all across America are trying to buy state supreme courts. They've already bought the lower courts. They bought most of the appeal courts. Now where there are elected candidates for state supreme courts, the largest player, right, more money is spent by the chamber of commerce, right, on state supreme court races than any other entity in America. Well, they obviously have an interest in what they're doing right now, right? What they're trying to do is create state appellate courts, on, and particularly the Supreme Courts, in such a way that they think they are less, uh, uh, you know, less likely to be loved by the trial lawyers. In turn, obviously, trial lawyers are trying to spend as much more money as they can to create those courts. So these things are happening. I believe this world will make it worse because it could more narrowly target people and more narrowly target the kinds of person you want. It won't just be, we want somebody who is representing insurance. You know, let's get somebody who represents our company on there, by God, and we'll find ways to try to go out and fund it. That happens every day in state legislators and on city councils. Uh, where, particularly where you see large corporate employers in a community. When a company dominates a local community, they try to make sure they get somebody on that city council. They try to make sure that the state representative is somebody who not just represents them, but who literally works for them. That's a problem right now. All across state legislatures, a problem that I think is you know, one of the great silent and, but most deadly uh, attacks on our fundamental sense of democracy that's going on right now. I think I've got one more. Corey's telling me I've got one more. But nobody else has one more. Well, uh, I'm sorry. The question had been whether you think this prediction is going to lessen the importance of um, issue framing in terms of values or actually inform how that targeting is done. And I feel like you've already answered that question. Yeah, I, I do think it's going to inform how it's done. I mean, I do think that, again, I, I don't think that we're going to get candidates that are less smart or uh, have you know, f uh, fewer values or that they don't think those values are going to be able to, uh, are as important in their process. I think probably the opposite is true. You're going to know much more about them because of it. But we, again, what is scary about it is not what happens to individual candidates, I think, but what happens to the forum of conversation, what happens to the corporate for-profit interests that clearly for the first time will have much more incentive to play in this game. 
not to play in the game as a lobbyist, but to play literally in the game about who is elected uh, to represent all of us, uh, because they will see those people as representing them as well. So welcome to that new world. It's yours, like it or not. And thank you very much for having me today. <laughs>